Do we have any <laughs> any questions before we start? <laughs> ah, do we have any questions before we start? No, my plan, original plan for today was to kind of take the final chapter and start looking at exercise set three. Uh, I think we have to settle for only the lecture, okay? Uh, there is uh, a lot of other things to do for me today, so uh, if that's okay with you, we will uh, leave the lecturing to until the last week, which is next week. Okay. So then hopefully we won't spend too much time together today. The final chapter is about monopoly. Last time we discussed uh, applications of the perfectly competitive model, mainly related to regulations, uh, price regulation, quotas, tariffs, taxes, and so on. So uh, the final chapter is about uh, kind of the, the other side of the story, so to speak, the monopoly side. So let's uh, have a look at it. Are you struggling with different passwords? We have a lot of different passwords you have to remember, or do you only have one? Two. Two. Okay. Two. Yeah. Yeah, they say these experts say you should be careful with having one or two. You should have ten or hundred or maybe millions. But, uh, I am struggling with at least fifty at the same time. So it's kind of hard to keep track of them. Okay. So the lecture part is uh, here, no. chapter 10. <coughs> Hello, have a seat. Okay, so in uh, this chapter 10 we discuss uh, market power monopoly and monopsony have you heard about this term monopsony before no it's uh, yeah good idea yeah um okay <coughs> the definitions uh, are as follows okay if we have a perfectly competitive market then we have an infinite number of producers as well as consumers. If we have a monopoly, then we have an infinite number of consumers, meaning we have a demand curve, but only one producer. The monopsony case is actually the exa exact opposite of, of, a, of a monopoly. So we substitute the consumer part with a single consumer, and we substitute the single producer part with an infinite number of producers. In reality? No. <laughs> I cannot. I can gi not give an example of any of these markets in reality. But you can think what it's about. Uh, now suppose you are looking to buy something. You, as an individual. Okay? And uh, the thing you're looking to buy is very rare. But still there is a lot of people who can sell it to you. That seems crazy, doesn't it? But it kind of have to be like that, okay? Because then you can act as a kind of reversed monopolist against these possible sellers, okay? But the problem with the argument is, of course, that if it's very rare, then it's typically not uh, the property of an infinite amount of sellers or producers. So uh, a monopsony is not a very common practical situation. But there could be situations where, uh, let's say, in Norway, we have certain organizations or people who own supermarkets. There is something called Coop in Norway. Have you heard about that? Yeah, that organization is owned by the consumers. So they kind of buy from themselves to some extent. Of course, in practice, they don't do that. They have to pay. But uh, obviously, they have a different kind of power situation related to the company than in a situation of 
or free or perfect competition. So that is something that perhaps may resemble a monopsony. We will not spend much time on the monopsony case here. We will uh, mainly discuss the monopoly. And the reason is straightforward, because a monopsony case is, at least in principle, analyzed in the same way. The only difference is, of course, that it's kind of the supply curve that plays the role of the demand curve. So it's it works the same, but you just have to pick the right curve, so to speak. So uh, we, we really don't bother wi much with discussing the actual solution of monopsony. It's, it's kind of just a reflection of the monopoly case. Which, of course, means that I, I won't ask you questions about monopsony on the exam. That is not necessary. Monopoly and monopsony are exact opposites and can be treated in the same way as it says here. A, monop a, mon a monopolist faces the market demand curve. The price-taking assumption of perfect competition is removed. And revenue is hence generated through P O Q times Q. So the main difference now between perfect competition in that case, revenue is generated through a constant P times quantity. Okay, that was the assumption underlying a perfect competitive market that the revenue generator could not influence the price. But in a monopoly revenue is generated through the demand curve, P O Q times Q. So this is the demand curve then. So these are Mathematically, only the only differences between these two models, basically, but th that it, it it has some consequences. It says here that in general, a monopolist will ration production to earn more profits compared to the perfectly competitive situation. So, in general, we would expect that in a monopoly, uh, the number of units sold in the market will be much lower than in a perfectly competitive situation. And of course, it means, if you think about the demand curve here, it means something, okay? If, if this is the perfectly competitive solution, we say here that in the monopoly, we kind of go in this direction, if this is quantity, when it comes to the behavior. So we try to decrease the amount here. And of course, what they achieve by doing that is a higher price, isn't it? The price goes up. So that's kind of the idea here, to try to ration down to get a price which is relatively higher in, in such a way that profits as a total increases. That's the idea. At the end here it says that pure monopoly is rare. However, sports and event markets have in general more monopoly-like situations than other normal markets. And we have discussed this previously in this course, haven't we? That in sport and event situations, there are kind of branded stuff like Manchester United. There is only one Manchester United. Okay, and if if customers only want to see Manchester United, they can't see Liverpool or Chelsea. Okay, and in that case, Manchester United is a monopolist, a true monopolist actually. Of course, in reality, even the strongest Manchester United fan could, from time to time, find it interesting to watch Liverpool or Sunderland or whatever. Okay, so they are kind of not. There is substitutes here, so uh, so uh, it's not kind of a, a perfect monopoly situation. If you, as a reader, only wants to read books by J John Irving, of course, John Irving is a, is, is a monopolist in that submarket. Oh, only John Irving readers. But as you probably know, most human beings who are interested in reading novels would uh, perhaps look at more authors than John Irving. Do you know John Irving? Have you heard about him? No. Maybe not. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. What authors do you know about? Shakespeare? Have you heard about him? That's an old, an old author, isn't it? What authors do you read? Don't you read? Do you only read kind of uh, microeconomic books and mathematics books and that kind of stuff? No, I assume you, you read something. Okay. So the general idea here is that th the markets that interest us are perhaps closer to monopolies 
than perfectly competitive markets. But again, as I argued, they are not real monopolies, perhaps. It's not such that Rolling Stones can kind of price their CD records as if they were the only band in the world, is it? They can't do that. If you want to buy a CD, it's normally priced just as much for Rolling Stones as it is for, should we say, what artists are popular today? Uh, Beyoncé, perhaps? Yeah, uh, there's no big price difference between the Rolling Stones album and the Beyoncé album, okay? So you see, they cannot, they, 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 are, they, don't, they don't act like monopolists here. They don't have kind of substantially higher prices. But if you look at sports markets, you see that, don't you? That these, uh, these, these big clubs, they may have more higher prices than the not so good clubs. So you see more of a kind of monopoly tendency in those markets than you see in most, uh, at least musical markets. And of course, the same holds for some of these famous uh, locational events like the La Scala Opera in Milan, for instance. Has anybody of you been there? No, I have not been there. Which is, of course, have very high ticket prices. If you want to go to the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Kelly, have you been there? Yes, sir. You have? It's kind of expensive, isn't it? It is. Yeah, more expensive than the similar part in in St. Petersburg, perhaps. Yeah. I was once at the ballet in St. Petersburg. Mostly middle class people go there. What did you say? The mostly middle class people go there. Most. Mostly middle class. Middle class mostly people. middle class people. Yeah. They go to the ballet in St. Petersburg, yeah. but in Moscow, it's top class people. Okay. So maybe the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow is a true monopolist, who knows? Okay. Okay, I thought it was the top class that uh, visited the Bolshoi Theater. <laughs> so you, you have a lot of money, Kelly. <laughs> if Abramovich can go, I can go there too. Yeah. Sometimes people buy the tickets for us, don't they? Yeah. You don't have to be stinkingly rich to yes. be able to see the World Championship final in football, necessarily, even though the black market prices may be very high. Okay. I hope I'm not uh, making ad any advertisement for this stuff. Keep, keep, keep out of it, okay? I see you have something here. You must stop this. It's not good for your health. <laughs> this was today's uh, moral. Okay. Uh, uh, as it says here, the monopoly situation is already defined. As the demand curve facing the monopolist is the market demand curve, POQ. And then we can straightforwardly kind of look at the solution, which we already have in, in principle discussed, that uh, uh, profits here is uh, constructed by taking the revenue part, which is price, which now is a function of quantity times quantity, and then we subtract total costs, or if you like, revenue minus costs. And if you take the derivatives of the profit by putting a prime here, then we can name this part, the revenue, the marginal revenue, as a consequence of taking derivatives, and of course this is the marginal cost. And if we equate that to zero to find the optimal solution, then we end up with this <coughs> general rule that marginal revenue sh should equal marginal cost. So what we kind of could sum up at this point then is that in a perfectly competitive situation, price should equal marginal cost, but in a monopoly, marginal revenue should equal marginal cost. That's kind of the, the basic differences between these two markets and how we handle them from a calculative point of view. Okay, now let's look at a, a general monopoly situation where we have a linear demand function. So we assume here that we have this POQ as a linear function uh, as A minus BQ, okay? Uh, <coughs> if we start by looking at a graph here, perhaps. So let's start by drawing this demand curve. So now we have that POQ. What kind of sound is this? Oh, it's the, the working guys. The 
course, the reason why we normally use a minus sign here is to, to kind of signal that this curve should go from up and down here. But if you have this a minus b cube, we can of course equate it to zero to find two crossing points. Maybe the easiest way is to start, as we have discussed before, by setting q to zero, and then we get a. So here is a point of uh, intersection with the second axis. And by doing this, we get the intersection with the first axis, the q-axis. And then we get here, what do we get? We get a equal to bq, and we can of course divide by b here, so a divided by b equals q. So we get another point here, which has a distance a over b, and then we can draw our demand curve. Okay. The marginal revenue curve can be straightforwardly computed in this case, can't it? Because given <coughs> this demand curve, we can construct the revenue curve by taking the demand curve, P of Q, and multiply by Q. So substituting in this expression instead of P of Q here pr produces this expression. A minus BQ, with parentheses, times Q. If you multiply in here, we get A times Q here and b times q squared there. OK, is this OK for you? Just simple multiplication. And then in order to find the marginal revenue, we have to take the derivative of the revenue curve, which equals this one. So we want to find the derivative of this curve with the variable q. And that produces a from the first element, and 2 times b times q to the power of 2 minus 1, which then is 2bq. So a minus 2bq would be the marginal revenue curve, given a linear demand curve. And if you look at the intersection of this curve, which by the way also is a linear curve, as you may see by the structure, it's only a linear expression in Q here. By equating that to zero, if we take a look at the marginal revenue curve, is A minus 2BQ, isn't it? Then by equating that to zero, or we could start by putting q equal to zero, as we did here, then this vanishes, so that produces a. So we have the same intersection on the second axis. So it starts here, but the intersection with the first axis changes now. Because by putting that one to zero, we get uh, a equal to 2bq, and q then is a over 2b, okay? Or if you like, a half times a over b. So the marginal revenue, cu revenue curve, if you have a linear demand curve, always is linear and it always halves this distance here. Okay, that's how it always will be. This is a general result. And, uh, and if you want to draw a, a situation of monopoly, then it could be nice to remember this, because then you, if you draw this one and, and that 6 here, you know that this one should intersect in 3, which is exactly the half of 6. OK, let's look at the solution itself. In this graph, we have introduced or reflected the demand curve. They call it average revenue in the book, by the way, from time to time, just to be so you know that the average revenue is the same as the demand curve. Uh, silly, of course, but uh, that's how economic theory are from times to times, different names on the same thing. And as long as the demand curve is linear, the marginal revenue curve is linear, it will be again cutting these distances in two, but we don't kind of continue as long as that we see that here. So this curve we have explained, and this curve we have explained. Then we introduce a marginal cost curve. In this case, you can see the red one here, it goes up like this. So this is not a linear curve, it's curved. So it must be nonlinear. And that, of course, also must mean that the total cost is also a nonlinear function, because the marginal cost is the derivative of the total cost. So it could, for instance, be that the, in this case, that the total cost curve is something like uh, 
like this. Kind of, uh, for instance, the third degree polynomial. In that case, the, the marginal cost would be the derivative here, so it would be something like this. which is a secondary de degree curve, which this could be a part of, okay? <coughs> if you like, of course, if in case if you have the total cost, we can also calculate the, the average cost, which would be the total cost divided by Q. And that would also have a similar fashion, as you can see. In this case, the average cost would be a Q squared, wouldn't it? Plus BQ plus C plus D over Q. Okay, you just divide by the total cost by Q to find the, the average cost. And you see it has a kind of similar pat pattern, although you have something here. So typically what will happen with this average cost curve of this structure is that it will probably be some kind of hook up there some, 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 some at some point or, or, or not. Often these curves here they look something like these. Okay, but we can can kind of see that necessarily here. So th maybe these are not actual examples of, of it. But the point is simple, isn't it? Um, we already argued that the solution in the monopoly case is to equate marginal revenue and marginal cost. And that solution is found exactly here, intersection between marginal cost and marginal revenue. And given that intersection, we can just pull down to find the optimal quantity and pull up into the demand curve to find the optimal price. Be aware of that, okay? In order to look at solutions when you have a demand curve and you want to find the price, you have to, from a certain point, go up to the intersection of the demand curve itself to, to find the price. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Because the demand curve gives us the price. When we find the quantity, we have to input that into the demand curve, which means going up to that point to, to find the price. And of course, the fact that this is the optimal point, which has the highest profit, means that if you kind of move in this direction, we introduce a loss. If you move in that direction, we also introduce a loss. So in this case, we kind of looked at two different quantities on each side of the optimal quantity. We can kind of argue, if you like, that in this situation, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So if you move in this direction, the marginal cost increases, okay? It means must mean that the difference between the marginal cost and the marginal revenue gives us the negative marginal profit here. So we can kind of look at into the, the kind of area that spans out in between the marginal cost and the marginal revenue curve as negative <laughs> generated profit or lost profit as it's called here. <coughs> so as you see what happens of course if you move rightly from the optimal point you will produce more but you will kind of sell at a too low price. If you move to the left, you will produce too little and sell at a too high price, if you like. Okay, this argument is perhaps uh, slightly more complex. Let's have a look at it. Okay. Now we return to elasticities and we're interested in kind of looking at the monopo monopoly solution by introducing elasticities into it. So before, as it says on the top here, the demand elasticity is defined as P divided by Q times dQ dP, or the derivative of Q with respect to P for the given demand curve. If we like, we can change this version by inverting it. So if A equals B, then of course 1 over A equals 1 over B. That's what we do when we move from this point into this point. So I just take this E of D and put 1 on top of it, then I get this one. But as long as I have a fraction, 
Inverting a fraction is just by taking what's under and put on top and what's on top and putting under. So then I get Q over P, inverting that one, and I get DP over DQ, inverting that one. And the nice thing about these differenti differentials, as we call them, is that the meaning of this is the derivative of Q with respect to P as a variable, and the meaning of this is the derivative of P with respect to Q as a variable. So we can kind of just turn them around and they, they contain their meaning. So this way of writing a derivative means that you take derivative of that function with respect to that variable. That's basically what it means. Moving from this point into this point, is also simple, just multiplying on each side of the equation with p. Okay? If I do that on the left-hand side, I get p times this fraction, which is this part. If I do it on the right-hand side, I get the p multiplied by this one, which can be reduced here. So I'm, I'm left with dp over dq times q only. That produces this equation, which has the number 1 here. So that's the explanation how we kind of move from the original elasticity definition to a slightly different way of writing it just. Okay, now we'll do a little trick here. The revenue, as we already have said, is constructed by taking the demand curve or the price as a function of Q and multiply it by Q. And at this point we want to look at the marginal revenue curve and we should probably know that when we take the derivative of a product of function we can do that by looking at the product the derivative and that equals the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function so we just utilize this rule to write the marginal revenue slightly different so in order to look at this as a product, of course, this P or Q we can name U, and this Q we can name V. Then we can apply this formula. So the derivative of U times V, the first part, will be the derivative of this one, dP dQ, times Q. Then we have covered that part. Then we have to add U, which is P again, and here I have just dropped the Q, okay? but it's kind of still there. So this is something we do from time to time in economics. We kind of slip the notation, as we say. There is a reason for it, okay? But it actually means the same. This P is the same as this P or Q, okay? Don't be confused by that. So the P is the same as the P or Q here. And then we should take the derivative of Q with respect to the variable Q, which of course is 1. So then we get P times 1 here. So we end up... with this part, don't we? And we probably see from equation 1 here that dp over dq times q can be written as p times 1 over ed. So we can substitute this part with this part, can't we? And of course, this part can be written as p over 1 over d, so I just write that directly instead of that one, and then I add p times 1, which is p. So that's how I came from, I reached this expression. So the marginal revenue can also be expressed as p over the demand elasticity plus p. In the monopoly case, we know that the solution is that the marginal revenue should equal marginal cost. Here we have an expression for the marginal revenue. Let's use that instead of marginal revenue here and just add mc as our marginal cost. Then we get mc equal to this expression, which is the re marginal revenue, which then mc equa equates p over ed plus p. Or alternatively, if we like it, we can kind of turn this equation around a little bit. Okay? So, by yeah, what I can do is that I, ca that I can move this one to that side. Then it's minus in front. Then I can divide by p and move that one over. Then I end up with this expression. 
So it turns out that minus 1 over ED could be written as P minus MC over P. Alternatively, of course, we can solve this equation with respect to P instead. Then we get this expression. So different ways of expressing the monopoly solution uh, where the demand elasticity is a part of the expression. And the reason why this is interesting is perhaps the form of this expression here. I believe we call this a markup. This is price mar ma minus marginal cost. That's kind of the profit we get, isn't it? Per unit we sell. And if we divide that by price, it could be interpreted as the kind of percentual markup or profit term you get related to the price. So this kind of has a certain meaning. Of course, if you have a, a high markup in, in doing something, then you earn a lot of money. Okay. This is a, a classical way of measuring this markup thing. So we kind of can say that minus 1 <coughs> or minus the inverse of the demand elasticity equals the markup. So this tells us that this markup concept is fully defined as, as long as we know the demand elasticity. Sometimes when you have the elasticity and uh, let's say the marginal cost, then of course you can find the monopoly price easily, can't you? That's kind of what we use this one for. So if this one is known to you as well as this one, it's straightforward to calculate the optimal price in the mo monopoly by this simple formula without going through this taking derivatives and so on. <coughs> so it may be helpful in many situations. So, the rule of thumb for monopoly pricing is that given knowledge of the marginal cost as well as the demand elasticity, this formula produces the monopoly optimal price. Okay, a few words about taxes. It says here that it's a straightforward tax effect. It says here on the right, with a tax T per unit, the firm's effective marginal cost is increased by the amount T. <coughs> now you can think about this. If, if you sell something, okay, a product, and the government says, for each one you sell, you have to pay me. Obviously, your marginal cost increases by this amount, okay? And that's what we mean here. So in this case, and luckily, you see in the previous case here, you had a marginal cost that kind of went up, okay? But in this case, you suddenly have a marginal cost which is flat. That, of course, means something. A flat MC means that basically that your total cost function equals some kind of constant times Q, doesn't it? because then the marginal cost is the derivative of this one, which is A, which is a constant, okay? So there are different assumptions underlying these two cost curves in these two examples. So in this final example, we do it simple and assume that the, the total cost is a proportional function, as we often tend to call this structure here. So it's just a proportion or a constant times the amount you sell, or a linear. Linear and proportional, I think the correct term is. The reason is straightforward. If you have a constant here, no added to this one, you will have to. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. It could be that as well, couldn't it? No, it's a linear one. Take the derivative, that one vanishes, and you're back to a constant. So as long as you have a linear cost function, you would get a constant marginal cost. And then, of course, it's straightforward to illustrate what happens in this tax case because this MC is shifted upwards, adding this T. So this distance is then T like the arrow here, and then the original solution, which produces Q0 here, and a price of P0, changes, of course, due to the tax. And the change is easy to see here, because the new marginal cost crosses the marginal revenue curve at this point. So it, uh, uh, the volume is even further to the left, but of course the price increases as a consequence. 
this is the this is the original quantity this is the original pricing then the tax has an effect leading to decrease in quantity and a higher price the point here perhaps to see is that the tax distance is this distance but the price cons price effect is big okay this is in this figure the the price change is almost twice or actually more or less twice the tax effect so if the government put one crown on taxes on the product it could mean that the price effect is two crowns okay so suddenly for the consumer point of view they pay much more than what the 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 state gets in revenue okay it kind of has an effect of making monopoly solutions even worse okay uh, because you kind of get by lifting the marginal cost you get in somewhat an even stronger monopoly situation so the rationing of quantity is bigger the price effect is more than the tax effect of course this depends on the shape of these curves so in this case we have a linear cost curve but a non-linear revenue curve suddenly uh, no sorry a non-linear marginal revenue curve okay in the previous example the demand curve was linear marginal revenue was linear in this case there are non-linear curves here but constant marginal cost curves so it kind of turns around now if we want to measure monopoly power we can kind of do that by looking at this so-called markup P minus MC over P as it says here it's equal to minus the inverse of the elasticity of demand which we showed in our previous example back here if you remember it says here if the firm's demand is elastic as in A okay so Elastic demand is kind of relatively flat demand, okay? It's not very steep, but relatively flat, okay? So elastic demand is in this situation. And if you look at, look at what happens here, if you have a marginal revenue curve and a marginal cost curve, of course the solution is here. And the idea is that by looking at this difference, we get some kind of feeling for how much money you can earn in this monopoly, okay? That's uh, what we argued about this this markup thing of course the markup is defined as p minus mc divided by p but for a given p of course it's enough to look at just this this subtraction here so that's the reason why we look at this p star minus mc so in this case for a given p star we can just look at this distance here to kind of get some feeling for how the monopoly works in this situation and the idea then is of course to compare it with a situation where demand curve are <sighs> more inelastic as we say or in the different in the opposite direction so in this case you have a marginal revenue curve which is very steep and you see in that case the difference between the price and the marginal cost increases dramatically so this is a much nicer situation for a monopolist he kind of has the, the potential of getting much more profit than in this situation due to the fact that here P minus MC is relatively small, but here P minus MC is very big. So that, that can kind of be one way of measuring monopoly power. So from a government point of view, who in general shouldn't like monopolies because they are not socially optimal, okay, as we discussed previously, this is worse than this. So if you what uh, do you think? You know, do you have a question? No, but uh, what you just said now, if the government don't like it, then why does monopoly exist actually? Why? <laughs> I, in general, monopolies don't exist, of course, as such. But there are kind of situations that look like them. And, and uh, they exist in situations, as we discussed, where creating competition is difficult. Okay. We have something we, we refer to as natural monopolies. Uh, suppose you have a railroad that in some country, okay? 
in order to create competition on that hand, which really works, you should actually build a parallel railway, railway network, okay? Then you have two that can compete. You can try to make competition by engaging different companies to run the same railroad. But of course, the fact that there is only one railroad has effect on the potential to create real competition. The problem with building a kind of parallel railroad network is that it's extremely expensive for society. So from society's point of view, then OK, maybe it's more expensive to build a parallel railway network than the actual cost of having a monopoly here. Okay? So there is obviously situations where there could be monopolies from a kind of natural point of view. If there is only one source of gold in the world, of course, that is a natural monopoly, isn't it? It doesn't mean, <sighs> of course, there's a lot to this kind of discussion, OK? But uh, I don't think we should go in more detail than this, OK? Yeah. But the point here is that there is a way of measuring mon monopoly power. And as I said, if the government or somebody else observe things that look like monopolies, then they can analyze it like this. And then if the only power they have is to change one of them, then they can pick the one which has the most negative effect, which produces the largest profit for the monopolist, which again is kind of negative related to society as a whole. But of course, in general, Kelly, I agree with you. We should get rid of all monopolies. They are not nice. Okay. But we see things that look like them from time to time. And perhaps, unfortunately, especially in sport markets and event markets. Maybe we don't want to get rid of the monopolies there. I don't know. Huh? What are your judgment? Should we forbid the Rolling Stones to be a brand name? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, these football fans, they have this song, there's only one, you know, whoever, OK? So there is only one here, OK? <laughs> There is only one David Beckham. There are, there are not two David Beckhams, not three or not, not 100. There are players that can mimic David Beckham. Uh, and in the football case, that's, that's good. In that case, you can create competition on David Beckham. But it doesn't help in the music industry, does it? There are a lot of groups that can play exactly like Beatles, but they're still not Beatles. And the willingness to pay for these Beatles copy groups are far from the willingness you would have to pay for Beatles. Of course, that in the Beatles case, it's kind of special as uh, there are two people in the original group which is dead. Okay, so it, it's hard to, to recreate them. But in the Rolling Stones case, the same argument holds, of course, that uh, there is only one Rolling Stones. And people are interested in buying for Rolling Stones, not for copies. Paintings, we are all aware of it, isn't we? But the point there is, of course, to fool a customer, to believe that it is the real thing. Okay, it is easy to copy a painting. Or Maybe not easy, but with today's technology, relatively easy. So uh, this is kind of what, what this is about. A few words about monopsony. It is less important, and then I, uh, I said why. And of course, uh, you kind of ask the relevant question here. That's the reason why it's not important, because it's kind of not, not something we see very often, if we see it at all. It says here, it is the exact opposite of monopoly, where the inverted supply curve times quantity plays the role of the revenue curve. It's, it has a name, actually. It's called an expenditure curve, and you use the letter E for it, just to be certain to confuse everybody, which uh, at this point should have remembered that elasticity also uses E. And correspondingly, the derivative of this construct plays the role of the marginal revenue, named ME in that case. The demand curve plays the role of the MC, and is named marginal value MV. So the solution here is to put MV equal to ME. And this is kind of the recipe how to do it in case it's, it's necessary to actually find a monopsony solution. We will handle it through an exercise, it says. That's not correct. We will not handle it through an exercise. There are none of the exercises which are defined that, that kind of do this. I, I, I think I, I planned that in my head when I made the foil, but when I came to the exercises, I didn't find any suitable ones. Okay. That ends our discussion about monopoly. We will, of course, next week then look at some examples of mono monopoly in the exercise set three. 
uh, examples on how to calculate stuff and also how to kind of utilize this formula here. So that's the main content of the third exercise. And then, uh, and then basically, this course is finished. Let me just uh, put a few comments now. Okay. Now what we have done in this course is to look at two market forms. We have looked at perfect competition. And we have looked at monopoly. And they are kind of at an extreme of a scale here, <coughs> to some extent. Okay. In this situation, we have one producer and an infinite number of consumers. In this situation, we have an infinite number of producers and an infinite number of consumers. But of course, there are a lot of real-time situations in between here. We will, let's say, have two producers, maybe an infinite number of consumers, and so on. So if you change these numbers here, especially moving that one up to two or three or four or five, maybe moving that one down to, s to some limited amount of consumers, then we are outside of the kind of workability of these models in principle. But still, the argument is that as long as these two models kind of make extremes here, we would expect that reality would fall in between these two extremes. So if the difference between the perfectly competitive solution and monopoly solution is not that big, okay? And we had an example on that here, didn't we? Uh, here. In this case, the difference according to the market is relatively small here, so we should kind of expect not a big difference between the perfectly competitive solution and the monopoly solution. Then, then okay, both these two models can give us some valuable information on how we would expect this market to behave. But of course, then again, in other situations where there are big differences, like in the right part here, then we probably should go in here doing something different. And doing something different here is using game theory. So everything in between here, which of course is the biggest part, needs the use of game theory methods in order to be analyzed in a quantitative way, or a mathematical way. Luckily for you, you will get some game theory in the next course. Okay, so uh, instead of spending a lot of time talking about game theory, which by the way is my favorite subject, uh, I leave that to the next teacher in the ongoing course here, which is called something which I don't remember. Uh, you will find it on the, on the curriculum plan. Now recall what we did here. Um, we spent most time on the first one, didn't we? Only one tenth of the course we discussed Monopoly. The remaining part was the perfectly competitive situation. It was clearly divided in two. One part was related to cu customers or consumers or the demand side. The other part was related to producers or the supply side. And in both situations, we kind of started with the, with the general solution here, which looks kind of like this in this situation, while it in this situation looks like this, if you like, okay? If you have a marginal cost here and demand here and marginal revenue here, and here you have supply and demand. This is kind of what you can think about these two settings. But we spent kind of most of the time arguing for the existence of a demand curve as well as the supply curve. And we made some arguments about what kind of problems we need to solve to arrive at these constructs. The monopoly is kind of straightforward in the sense that you only have to substitute a constant price with the POQ, and then of course you behave as before, assuming profit maximization <coughs> interest from the monopolist, monopolist point of view, and then you can find a solution. And uh, here is the monopoly solution, intersection between marginal cost and marginal revenue. Here is the perfectly competitive solution, intersection between the marginal cost or price and This is the price. Demand curve is the price, so it's intersection between the, the price curve, the demand curve, and the marginal cost. Price equals marginal cost. So this, this distance in this case is kind of the 
difference between perfect competition and monopoly. Okay, that's all I'm able to do today. Do we have any questions, comments, suggestions? Is the plan for the rest of the course okay? We know next week we will spend on exercise set three as well as looking at the previous exam as well as discussing exam as slightly in general. Okay. Again, if you want to talk to me about this course, if somebody is nervous for the exam, please come to me, okay? I will uh, make your life easier. Tuesday will be the... Final. Yeah. Tuesday will be the final, and that Tuesday is the 7th, yeah. and the exam is the 21st. So you have a reasonable time to prepare, I would expect. Yeah. No more questions? What did you say? Yeah, I can uh, try to um, find some more exercises. And uh, you can look at in the next week. Yeah. There's a lot of exercises in the textbook and they even have solutions, some of them. <laughs>